Welcome to the Biblical Languages Podcast, brought to you by Biblingo. We bring together the latest research in linguistics, language acquisition, and biblical studies to better understand the biblical languages and ultimately the biblical text. As always, this episode is brought to you by Biblingo, the premier solution for learning, maintaining, and enjoying the biblical languages. Visit biblingo.org to learn more and start your 10-day free trial. So let me welcome all of you to this live podcast recording. We are going to be discussing how to read deeply in Greek and Hebrew. I think Travis posted this on our community forum page as like a workshop in fluency, and we will be, be talking about that. But ultimately, the goal, I think, for most people is to read deeply, and we'll talk about what that means as well, in the original languages. So we're going to basically say that fluency is the means to reading deeply, and we will explain what all that means as we go along. Okay, so we are going to have time for questions at the end. I'm going to try to go for probably an hour or so if I can squeeze everything in that I want to say. And then the last 30 minutes will be devoted to questions. So one other thing, this is basically a section of the textbook that I'm writing. I'm writing one for Greek and one for Hebrew. Basically, these textbooks will be paired to the lessons in Greek and Hebrew in Biblingo. And one of the things that I do in the textbook is basically have these like second language acquisition SLA sections where I talk about, in this case, reading and why that's important and how that's specifically related to exegesis and how do we go about reading deeply. So we are basically going to walk through the outline of that section. So this is, this is it. First, we're going to discuss what is reading. Second, what it means neurologically to read deeply. Third, harnessing fluency to develop deep reading. Fourth, reading deeply versus exegesis. And finally, we'll discuss how to build fluency with Biblingo. And that will be related to deep reading, of course. So what is reading? Before we get there, there's a problem. And I want to address this problem because it is, you know, really the reason why Biblingo exists is because there are many people who go to seminary or university, or they don't, and they just try to study Greek and Hebrew on their own. And many people don't succeed. So the current statistic that I've heard is 10% of people who study Greek in seminary will go on to use it in their ministry. 1% of uh, people who study Hebrew in seminary will go on to use it. So 1%, basically nothing. So I want to describe this problem also in terms of literature on fluency in reading a first language. So this is from an article on how to teach reading. And they discuss this very basic problem for English readers of, you know, their first language. So it says this lack of fluent reading is a problem for poor readers because they tend to read in a labored, disconnected fashion with a focus on decoding at the word level that makes comprehension of the text difficult, if not impossible. So this is very much how many people read Greek and Hebrew. It's very labored, disconnected. I'm going word by word. And comprehension of the text is difficult, if not impossible. And so they go on to say that the most compelling reason to focus instructional efforts on students becoming fluent readers is the strong correlation between reading fluency and reading comprehension. So this, I will argue, is part of the problem with our seminaries today and our universities and our textbooks that don't focus on reading fluency. The reason why people cannot comprehend the text is because they don't focus on reading fluency. So this is the problem. And like I said, it is a problem also just for, you know, young students, first, second, third, fourth graders, right, who are reading in English in their native language. And they can speak just fine, but they struggle to read. And there's reasons why they struggle to read. And that affects their reading comprehension, right? Their, their lack of reading fluency affects their reading comprehension. So that's the problem. And the solution... I will argue, 
is that the ability to read deeply in the original languages of the Bible is the most reliable way to uncover the meaning of the text. So the problem, let me just go back to this and to clarify here, the problem is that being bad at reading makes you bad at reading comprehension, okay? So ultimately, we want to comprehend the text, right? That's the assumption. But if we can't read Greek and Hebrew well, we can't comprehend the text. So the solution is that we want to read deeply in the original languages of the Bible, and that is the most reliable way to uncover the meaning of the text, right? So we have to develop the skill of reading in order to use that to uncover the meaning, to comprehend what we're reading. And I will argue that developing reading fluency is the only way to engage in deep reading. So we want to engage in deep reading of the text because that's how we comprehend it and uncover the meaning of it. And the way we do that is to develop reading fluency. So what is reading? This can't just be taken for granted, but you know, a, a very simple definition is provided by William Grabe. Reading can simply be defined as a complex ability to extract or build meaning from a text. So again, this definition of reading is about meaning. And this is you know, basically what Grabe says, right? That we want to get the meaning out of the text, extract it, right? Or build meaning from that text, okay? So we're gonna come back to this definition when we talk about exegesis in a bit, but it's important to understand at the outset, what are we talking about when we talk about reading, right? We're not talking about merely uttering the, the sounds of, of a language. It, it has to be connected to the meaning that the sounds represent. So there are a lot of steps in reading, and this is a very simplified list of the steps involved in reading. But this is just some of what's going on. So visual perception. So when you read, you have to focus your eyes on something. So there has to be this perception of different letters and basically how those letters are connected. Orthographic identification. So this is actually identifying the letters. So we will see an example of this in a second, but it, it's not enough to have a certain visual stimulus, right? You have to actually identify the letters and know, okay, this is the letter M or whatever. And so in some languages, this is easier than others. Obviously it's trivial in English, right? For us native English speakers, but it's not so trivial in other languages. And then we have a phonological representation. So once your eye senses a, we'll call it a grapheme, right? A, a symbol that represents a sound. Then we have to know what that sound is, right? So if I look at the letter R, right? I have to know that that symbol represents a certain phonological representation uh, for the speaker of that language, okay? And then I have to have um, some sort of lexical retrieval. I have to string that phonological representation, representation together for all the sounds in that word. And then I have to pair that sound in my head to some sort of word with meaning. That word with meaning has a certain morphosyntactic features, right? So for example, certain words are nouns, certain words are verbs, adjectives, etc., etc. So all of this is information about the word. And that information also needs to be interpreted quickly in context. Okay. And then we have pros prosodic knowledge. So this is how we read a text, a, a like fuller text, let's say a whole sentence at least, particularly the intonation involved. And we will get into examples of this as well, but prosody is a very important part of understanding the meaning of a text. And unfortunately, or fortunately, it's not often conveyed in the orthography, okay? so. The prosody, how you're supposed to read it, particularly for Greek, let's say, there's nothing in the Greek text that tells you to have this sort of intonation, even you know a rising intonation with a question. There's nothing that tells you that in the orthography itself. Okay, so we have to know as we're reading that this is a question from the context, and then there's connected text knowledge. So I'm connecting constantly what I'm currently reading to what I've just read, and I'm interpreting what I'm currently reading in light of what I've just read. And I'm also comprehending at a global scale, what is the author trying to do with this text? Okay, so those are some of the steps in reading. So now I wanna just take an example of this, reading Marathi. 
Okay. This is a language in India, I believe. And I just took this as a language that hopefully most people don't know. And we'll use it as an illustration to figure out what needs to happen for us to learn how to read this sentence. Okay. In this foreign language, this language that is probably not your own. So first what you have to do, like I said, is you have to have this visual perception. Okay. You have to actually see the letters. And again, for native English speakers, especially this isn't too hard because our letters are all disconnected. It's pretty easy to distinguish one from the other. This is not so easy in a language like Marathi where the letters are connected together and it's hard to parse out the different letters. And so that's the second step. It's orth orthographic identification. So we have to figure out, okay, what letter is being represented by this curve or this box? So I don't know this language. So I, I don't know how to do that here, but that's what you would have to do in order to learn how to read this sentence. And then what you would have to do is you'd have to figure out what each of those letters stands for in terms of the sounds of that language. And then after you know the sounds, you have to have an idea of what that string of sounds means. So the, the actual, so this is the lexical retrieval stage. You have to figure out the meaning of me, this first symbol here, I got the transliteration just below it. Me, I don't know what that means in this language. So I have to figure out if I want to learn how to read this language, um, Marathi, I have to figure out what me means. And then I also have morphosyntactic knowledge. I want to have cer a certain level of knowledge of, okay, if me means I, I, I don't know. I don't know if this is actually, you know, the Marathi is, you know, I am eating fish is me, mase, kata, ahi, ahe. I don't know if that's word for word there, but I would have to figure that out, right? I would have to figure out some sort of extra meaning or the morphosyntax, basically, of this word me in order to read it and understand it in context. Okay. So those are all the things I have to do just to get to the point where I can gloss this in English, right? That kind of reading is often what happens with Greek and Hebrew, right? This word equals this, this word equals this, and I just kind of translate back and forth, okay? So this is, if we were to learn Marathi, this would be the first step, and, and it is the first step, right? I have to go through these five things, and I have to basically become skilled at each of these things, okay? Now, there's other things in order to really um, comprehend what's going on with this sentence that I would want to know. For example, prosodic knowledge, right? So I am eating fish, is probably, well, almost certainly in, in the context of a text, the answer to at least an implicit question, right? So let's say the implicit or even explicit question in the text is, who is eating fish? I might say to that, I am eating fish versus the implicit question of the text being, are you eating a fruit? I would say, I'm eating fish. So you can see I am eating fish versus I'm eating fish. That's prosodic knowledge. So we, in one case, I am stressing I, and in the next case, I am stressing fish at the end. And those two sentences mean different things, okay? They don't mean the same thing. And the sentence just, I'm eating fish, doesn't tell us how to interpret whether it be I'm eating fish or I'm eating fish, that sentence. So what we have to do is we have to connect this sentence, I am eating fish, with the rest of the text, right? And this is where the connected text knowledge comes in to ask, okay, what question either explicitly or implicitly is being asked in this text, right? And then that will inform how we read the sentence. So prosody is a key metric that's used to help us see whether someone is actually understanding the text that they're reading. And finally, there's comprehension. So for example, I might be using this sentence as a reason for saying that I don't need anything else to eat. No, I'm eating fish, right? And so this sort of higher level comprehension of the text where I'm eating fish, again, there's nothing about that sentence that would mark it as a reason. But if I connect that sentence in the context of what I'm reading at a global scale in the text, then it might be the case that I am eating fish is a reason for something, right? A reason that I don't need any other food, okay? So those are all things 
we need to know when we're reading. Okay. So that's deep reading, right? Just to go back to this really quick. What we want at the end of the day, right, is this last step of comprehension. We want to be able to comprehend the biblical text like the authors intended it. Okay. So in order to get there, we have to go through all of these stages. Okay. And we have to get, get good at them. And so basically now what we're going to discuss is what does it look like to read deeply from a neurological perspective? What's going on inside of our brain when we are reading deeply, meaning when we are comprehending the text, right? And, and so this is key. This is what we actually want. We want to comprehend the text. So I broke up those different steps to reading into, you know, the first five and then the next three in the previous slides. And these have been broken up in the literature as well. There's basically two levels, lower level processes and higher level processes. So things like visual perception, orthographic identification, phonological representation, lexical retrieval, and morphosyntactic knowledge are all lower level processes. Okay. So this is what William Grabe, again, says about lower level processes. The automatization of letter sound relations is the foundation of all alphabetic reading. Fluent readers have very large and automatic recognition vocabulary knowledge, and that vocabulary knowledge is highly correlated with reading ability. Okay, so what does that mean? Basically, what we want to do when we are learning to read is we want to make all of these lower level processes automatic, very fast, right? What I tell people is you should be able to read Greek and Hebrew. And when I say read in the sense, I mean, pronounce the letters either in your head or out loud. You should be able to read Greek and Hebrew in that sense and think about what you ate for breakfast this morning. Okay. We can do this in English, right? We can be thinking about something else entirely as we're reading. And you look up and you say, what in the world did I just read? I have no idea. I was reading and I was thinking about something else, right? What's going on when we do that? What we're doing is we're continuing all of these processes, right? Visual perception, at least some of them orthographic identification, phonological, at least the phonological representation, okay? We not, might not be able to remember, I mean, even the lexical retrieval, right? We're pronouncing it correctly and more focused on knowledge. On it, really, really, I would argue all of these. We're doing all this in our head. We're not putting our attention on what we're reading, but we're actually reading it. We are reading the text and we're, we're reading it accurately. We're just not thinking about what we're reading, Okay. So that means that these lower level processes can be automatized, right? So well that we don't have to think consciously about any of them. Okay. We can just say whatever we're reading. So this is where you want to be for Greek and Hebrew, right? Fluent readers have, again, very large and automatic recognition vocabulary knowledge. And all of this is correlated with reading ability, right? If I'm struggling to learn or remember what the S sound is, right? Um, if, I'm, if I'm looking at the S grapheme and I'm struggling to remember what the sound is, there's no way for me to read through a text fluently, okay? So I have to have the orthographic identification, the phonological representation, even the lexical retrieval, right? The, the words, I have to have all of those things down very well and I have to be very fast at them in order to read fluently, okay? So this leads us to the higher level processes. Again, this is Grabe. He says, overall, comprehension of a text is created when the reader builds a semantic network of ideas drawn from the text to form a text model of comprehension. The text model of comprehension requires that semantic information from clause level processing be combined in a network of central ideas and references that recur through the text. Readers form links across ideas that are repeated, are referred to again, or are inferred in order to maintain a coherent interpretation of what they read. Okay, so we're doing all these things as we read. We're just automatically creating this coherent interpretation of what we read, right? Particularly for fluent readers. And we're doing this through building this semantic network of ideas, right? Connecting what we're reading currently to what we just read before, right? And what we might even anticipate reading in the future, right? So all of this is done automatically. We are just naturally making these kinds of connections, okay? 
for fluent readers. So this is really what we want. We want to get to the point where in Greek and Hebrew, we can be thinking about what we read in Romans 1 when we're at Romans 11, okay? And the way to do that is to get very fast at reading, right? And basically read it all in one sitting, right? You, you won't be able to do it if you don't read it all in one sitting. But if you're struggling over every other word, there's no chance you can be thinking about Romans 1 when you're at Romans 11, okay? So the idea here is that in order to make these connections, it presupposes we are very good at the lower level processes, okay? In order to build this semantic network of ideas. So now I want to talk a little bit about like what's actually happening in our brains when we do this. And, and this is really where I think it's, first of all, very interesting. But secondly, I, I, I think it's very important for us to understand really what's going on. Like, why is it that some people who read in Greek and Hebrew can understand what they're reading and some people cannot, right? And really this parallels for a second language. It, it parallels a child's brain who's learning to read and an adult who has already learned to read and is, let's say, an expert or fluent reader, okay? So this is from Marianne Wolf's book, Proust and the Squid. Very, very good book on reading. Highly recommend it. She says this about the novice's reading brain. In a child's brain, unlike an adult's, the first large activation area covers far more territory in the occipital lobes, i.e. visual and visual association areas. Okay, so that means that in a child's brain, and this is unlike an adult's, they are focusing more on the visual and visual association areas, those lower level processes, right? They, their brain is actually putting more attention, more brain power towards visual things because they, they don't have those lower level processes automatized yet, okay? So very important, there is also a great deal more activity in both hemispheres. This may seem counterintuitive at first, but think about what goes into becoming skilled at anything. In the beginning, learning any skill needs a great deal of cognitive and motoric processing and underlying neuronal territory. Gradually, as the skill becomes highly practiced, there is less cognitive expenditure and the neuronal pathways also become streamlined and efficient. This is slow motion development towards spe specialization and automaticity in the brain, okay? So now we're gonna contrast this with the expert's reading brain, which Wolf also describes. Like Frodo, so this is, uh, she had just talked about Frodo in the previous paragraph, not important, but part of the sentence. Expert readers use different comprehension processes as well as different semantic and syntactic processes with all their corresponding regions in the cortex to figure out a text. So first of all, just at a very basic level, expert readers are using different processes to get to the meaning of a text than novice readers, okay? So when readers generate inferences about what a text might mean, researchers find a bi-hemispheric frontal system activating around Broca's area. When expert readers integrate this generated inference with the rest of their background knowledge, an entire language-related system in the right hemisphere seems to be used. This second set of inferential processes requires far more work by the right hemisphere system than is needed by the earliest simple decoding tasks of the beginning reader. Okay, what did she just say? Basically, here's the idea. The right hemisphere is now being used for meaning-related things, okay? So because the lower-level processes are all automatized and we don't really need to think about them anymore, we can devote more of our brain to meaning. And this is exactly what we want, right? We can think about something else while we are reading the text, right? So that allows us to be thinking about Romans 1 when we're reading Romans 11, right? If we are struggling to simply say a word in the language, to connect the orthography to a sound and figure out what that sound is referring to in terms of a word and then figure out what that word means, we don't have the mental capacity to be thinking about other things, right? We All of our attention is on figuring out what this word is, okay? We don't want to do that. What you want to be able to do in Greek and Hebrew is you want to be able to think about the author's argument, right? This is what we do in English when we read. And the idea is that if we can make basically the processes in the brain much faster and easier, 
the lower level processes, then we can devote more attention to meaning. And so this is what happens. This is again from Wolf's book. This is you know, 500 milliseconds. Basically, she says every word gets 500 milliseconds. You see this word and for the you know fluent expert reader, they very, very quickly go through all of these processes, right? The visual representation. And you can see in the diagram that different areas are lighting up in the brain during this 500 milliseconds. And so all of these things are happening in the fluent reader's brain. <laughs> and because particularly the visual features are happening so quickly, there's a lot of time, there's more time to devote to building a semantic network, as Grape says. And this is kind of the conclusion that Wolf has. The greatest gift to the deep reader. The fluent, comprehending reader's brain is on the threshold of attaining the single most essential gift of the evolved reading brain, time. With its decoding processes almost automatic, the young fluent brain learns to integrate more metaphorical, inferential, analogical, effective background and experiential knowledge with every newly one millisecond. For the first time in reading development, the brain becomes fast enough to think and feel differently. This gift of time is the physiological basis for our capacity to think endless thoughts most wonderful. Nothing is more important in the act of reading. So here's the idea. You want those lower level decoding processes to be automatic. And that allows you to integrate the metaphorical, inferential, analogical, all the things having to do with meaning as you get faster at the lower level processes. Okay. So it is really, really important that when you see a sigma in Greek, you don't have to think about what that is standing for, right? It stands for a certain sound and you should not have to think about it. If you have to think about it, that's where you need to focus your attention. And we will talk more about that in a second. So harnessing fluency to develop deep reading. Let me go back to the problem. The problem is that today in seminaries and universities, people are not becoming fluent readers. And this makes them read the text in a labored, disconnected fashion with a focus on decoding at the word level. And it makes comprehension of the text difficult, if not impossible. This is the problem, okay? And the reason why we should focus on fluency is because there's a strong correlation between reading fluency and reading comprehension. So if we want to be able to understand the text, we need to become fluent readers. So that's the problem, okay? So we said the solution is to become a deep reader through fluency. So William Grape, again, defines fluency as the ability to read rapidly with ease and accuracy and to read with a appropriate prosodic word stress and phrasing while understanding the text. Okay. So this is what it means to have reading fluency. How do we do that? Let me just summarize where we've been and bring all these pieces together. Okay. So we said that deep reading is the best way to understand the meaning of the text. That's ultimately what we want. We want to understand the meaning of the Greek and Hebrew text. We also say that deep reading is only possible when lower level processes are done quickly and automatically. Okay. So basically the idea is that we don't want to devote attention, our cognitive power to things like orthographic representation, right? We want to devote all of our cognitive power to how the discourse is connected together, right? How Paul or Jesus or Moses are connecting ideas. That's what we want. So three, fluency development involves making the lower level processes quick and automatic. This is what Grabe said. It is the ability to read rapidly with ease and accuracy and to read with appropriate prosodic word stress and phrasing while understanding the text. So to develop reading fluency, is to develop the skill of reading easily and accurately. It is to basically create a situation where I am not devoting as much cognitive effort to those lower level processes. That's what fluency development does for us. And so for pushing each of these processes to be faster builds fluency, okay? So going back to those lower level processes, if you are struggling to 
again, l- l- let's just say have lexical retrieval. I know I've used the orthography thing. If you are struggling to remember words as you are reading the text, you cannot read fluently, okay? You have to get to the point where your lexical retrieval is automatic, right? When I see the word lower in English, I'm just looking at it right now. <laughs> when I see the word lower, I don't have to think about what it means. I mean, it doesn't take me very long at all. It's automatic. And so you have to have a very large vocabulary. That is something that is a necessary prerequisite to reading deeply, okay? The letter to sound correspondence, right? Graves said is the foundation of all alphabetic reading. If you are struggling to remember what sound a certain graphene makes, you have to get better at that. If you do not, you will not be able to read the text fluently And you will not be able to read the text in a way that would mimic someone who can comprehend it at speed, right? How the original addressees of the text would have understood it, okay? So this is what we want to do. We want to make all these processes faster so that we can ultimately read any text deeply, okay? So at at this point, I want to just like pause and talk about how this perspective engages with the idea of exegesis, okay? So the literature that I've been drawing from up to this point has been entirely not biblical studies. Um, It hasn't just been the SLA literature, but it has not been biblical studies, okay? So exegesis is this kind of construct. So Nick and I did an episode on this a couple of years ago. It is this scholarly construct. It is not something that if you were to ask someone on the street, what is exegesis? They probably would not be able to tell you what that word meant, okay? So as a scholarly construct, it's something that people define differently, okay? And basically, there are two definitions, okay? And what we're going to see is that they're going to interact with reading in different ways. So before we get to these two definitions, let's go back to the definition of reading. Reading can simply be defined as a complex ability to extract or build meaning from a text. So this is, you know, you could put exegesis here. (laughs) You could say exegesis can simply be defined as a complex ability to extract or build meaning from a text. And that would probably fit a lot of biblical scholars definition of exegesis, particularly the extracting thing. People like to use that language for exegesis because of the root of it in, in Greek. So this is already, we can see, right? If we just lay these two definitions side by side, as we'll see with the exegesis definitions, we'll see in a second. There, there might be some conflict, right? What are we doing when we approach the text? Do we want to do exegesis or do we want to, to read, right? Those are, they could be, could be competing things, okay? So here's, here's again two definitions of exegesis. First, Douglas Stewart. The process of careful analytical study of biblical passages undertaken in order to produce useful interpretations of those passages. The goal of exegesis is to know neither less nor more than the information actually contained in the passage. And here is Donald Hagner. The goal of exegesis is to articulate the meaning of a passage as it was intended by the original author. So these are two different definitions of exegesis, okay? In Douglas Stewart's, exegesis is used to determine meaning, okay? It is a process and it's undertaken to produce useful interpretations, and those interpretations should reflect the information actually contained in the passage, okay? So basically what's happening is that exegesis is giving us the meaning. In this sense, it's very close to our definition of reading, right? Where we're trying to extract or build meaning from the text. Hagner's definition of exegesis. He says, the goal of exegesis is to articulate the meaning of a passage as it was intended by the original author. So if we're just articulating the meaning of a passage, it presupposes that we know the meaning. So exegesis is used to describe a known meaning. So in this sense, exegesis, according to Hagner, is not necessarily about determining a meaning, right? It's about being able to describe it to everyone else, articulate it, okay? So, Basically, what I will argue is that the first definition of exegesis is a bad one, okay? In the sense that we actually don't want to use exegesis to determine the meaning. 
what we want to do to determine the meaning is deep reading. And that involves honing your intuitions about the language, learning the language well, so that you can read the text and understand what the author is saying. We want to use exegesis, rather for what Hagner says, to articulate the meaning precisely. Okay, that's a different goal. And I think that that is the right one. I'll give an example. And, I, and I'll tell you why I don't think we should use exegesis to determine the meaning. The problem is that basically exegesis often means determining the meaning of a text through using categories supplied by grammars and dictionaries. So if the grammar or dictionary is wrong <laughs> or incomplete, or you are interpreting it wrongly, then you are going to miss the meaning of the text or even, and this happens all the time, right? If you go to the grammar and you look through all the different options, you are often not given guidance on what in the particular context, the syntactic context or greater context would lead me to this particular interpretation of the genitive. So there's just this kind of buffet of options for what the genitive can mean. But if I don't have any way of determining which option, then what people often do is pick the one that they like best. And that's not, not always the case. They might just pick the one that they think is best because of a certain context. But it is very easy to just read into the text something that you found in a grammar and you might not have intuitions for, but you can say, well, this is found somewhere else and the same applies here, okay? And the problem is that many exegetes even lack the language skills required to read and comprehend a text. So what we're left with is exegesis being done by people who can't use the language well enough, right, to read deeply. So I'll give an example of this in practice and in translation. There are many, many examples we could go to. Here's Exodus 22, 22, 22. Okay. So there are three infinitive absolutes. So if you don't know what an infinitive absolute is in Hebrew, it is this construction where you basically repeat the verb in an infinitive form just before the finite verbal form. So, ane te ane. You, you can hear even the similarities, right? Ane, and then there's the te ane. So the ane is in the infinitive absolute. So uh, if you were to, quote unquote, literally, translate this into English, it would be, if you exploit him, okay? Again, if you were to literally translate into English, cry, he will cry. So, we can't literally translate it, okay? It just doesn't work at all. Different translations have done different things with it. And well, well let's just go over these translations and then it'll, it'll be revealing <laughs> why people are doing what they're doing. So the NIV, if you do and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. Okay, so the I will certainly hear their cry. Shemoa eshma zakato. That is quote unquote the kind of standard or typical way of talking about what this thing means, okay? The certainly. If you notice in the NIV, there's three instances of the infinitive absolute. There's the infinitive absolute with exploit, which the NIV has just do because it's following from the previous verse, and then cry, and then hear, okay? So they only translate one of them. I will certainly hear their cry. It's because in a conditional clause, it doesn't make sense to say certainly. If you certainly oppress them, and they certainly cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry, right? It wouldn't make sense. So what does the NIV do? They just leave it out. I will argue that the reason why they leave it out is because a certain perspective on Hebrew grammar. And basically the idea is that the basic meaning of this thing is the certainly clause where they don't leave it out. And because it doesn't fit in the previous two clauses, they just omit it. The NLT it translates one of them. If you exploit them in any way and they cry out to me, then I will certainly hear their cry. So the NLT actually is translating this infinitive absolute, this construction as in any way, if you exploit them in any way. So this is much better. And I think this is basically correct, right? For that clause, but then they leave out the equivalent infinitive absolute in cry, right? That's gone. The legacy standard Bible. And if you indeed afflict him, and if he earnestly cries out to me, I will surely hear his cry. Okay. So again, this is interesting because 
if you indeed afflict him, this is much closer to the certainly, really, I don't think makes sense in English. And now he's crying out. What if his crying out is not earnest? Um, let me provide you with the, the broader context here. This is God talking about the widows and orphans. So if you oppress widows and orphans, God will, th this is what will happen, right? If you do this, he will certainly hear his cry. And then the next verse talks about God basically killing them and making their wives widows and their children orphans. Okay. So God is serious about this. It really doesn't make any sense for the LSB to say, and if he earnestly cries out to me, meaning that, that let's say a child has to earnestly cry out in order for God to hear, right? All of these translations are influenced by our grammars. Our grammars having a certain perspective on this co construction. And I don't think it's the natural way to read the text if you just know the language or know the language better. I'll give you my translation and what's very interesting about this, also the KJV translation. So the KJV says, if thou afflict them in any wise and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. That's exactly how I would understand it, right? Of course, in different English. I would say, if you afflict them in any way and they cry out at all, I will definitely hear them. Okay, and this makes perfect sense of the context. If we assume that the infinitive absolute is just about the certainty or uncertainty of an event, okay, whether that event will certainly happen or not, then I would translate this just like the NIV, right? Because the infinitive absolute in this case doesn't make sense. It, you can't put certainly or uncertainly in, in a conditional clause. So the NIV, what do they do? They just leave it out. Uh, so this is coming from grammars, right? Our descriptions of the infinitive absolute. Going back to these texts and, you know, looking at them with this grammatical perspective will lead you to the translation that we see in the NIV, okay? And and even the LSB, right? If you indeed afflict him, that doesn't make sense in English or just logically, but it does make sense if, if you have this certain perspective that this is what this construction means. If you have a broader perspective on what the construction means, I would say it's basically a degree modifier, and that allows it to do a lot of different things, which I'm not going to go into. It doesn't really matter for our, our purposes. But what I think is going on in, in terms of the translations, basically all of the translations that follow the KJV closely, New King James Version, Revised Standard Version, et cetera, et cetera, just follow the KJV. And they all have the same sort of construction. But all the modern translations don't. And I think the KJV is right. And th that's just my intuitions and also you know, honestly, my linguistic analysis of this construction would lead me to that. Okay. What's interesting is that by and large, our knowledge of Hebrew has declined a lot since the time of the Reformation. So I'll give you some examples. The reformer Ulrich Zwingli, it was said he could preach in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew with as much ease as in the vernacular. So he could preach. How many people are graduating seminary and can preach in Greek, Latin, or Hebrew, right? One of them. How many can say a simple sentence? I, I was at a conference last week and I asked someone who had taken a lot of Greek in seminary, how do you say the person is coming to me? And she couldn't do it. And I, you know, I kind of feel bad. I put her on the spot. <laughs> um, but, but that's a very, very simple sentence. Okay. And, and so that is an example of the disparity between their, their knowledge of Hebrew and our knowledge of Hebrew and Greek. Yale's valedictorians delivered their class orations in Hebrew in 1785 in 1792. So these, these are just students, right? They are learning to use these languages to a different degree. So again, Zwingli is 16th century. This is Yale, 18th century. So here, this is a period of 200 years, right? Where we have attestations of people being able to speak Hebrew, produce it, novel things come out of their mouth in Hebrew. And in order to do that, you have to have very good intuitions. And I would argue that our intuitions about the language have declined. And a big part of that is a neglect of reading fluency. We can't read texts anymore fluently because we have relied on exegesis to determine the meaning. The early reformers all the way through 17, 1800s were using Hebrew in a living way, right? And the grammar translation method really only started in the early 1800s. And so before that, people were learning to use these languages and they were just better at it <laughs> and they have better intuitions. And, and those intuitions are going to be better 
at determining the meaning of the text than our grammatical constructs, however good they are. Okay. So how do we build fluency? This is just very brief. We at Biblingo are aware of this problem <laughs> and we want to try to solve it. So this is a, a screenshot of our mobile app. And I honestly just added the timer at the top. This is not what it will look like, but this is one thing that we're working on now. How do we introduce timed exercises for things like orthographic representation, things like lexical retrieval, things like reading an extended passage so that you can become a, a fluent reader of the biblical text, right? That's ultimately what we want. We ultimately want you to be a fluent reader so that you can have intuitions that as close as possible mimic native speakers, right? They will not mimic native speakers, but we can try to be as close as possible so that ultimately you can comprehend the text like it was originally designed to be comprehended. And unfortunately, in our day, the knowledge of the languages has declined. It just has. Again, this is another anecdote, but I remember seeing, and I looked for this earlier and I couldn't find it, but I remember seeing a, a test that A.T. Robertson, who um, you know was from the early 1900s, gave to his students in Greek. And they had to translate this quite lengthy, complicated English text into Greek. That kind of level of the language is just not, it's not happening today because we're settling for less in the classroom. Our methods just are not what they used to be. And we are, even a lot of scholars are losing the ability to read the text fluently. So with that, I want to just turn it over to you guys for questions. I know that there, this is a lot. So if you have any questions about anything, let me know. Let, let's see. There's some questions on when the grammar will be available. Yeah. So the plan is basically I have about half of it, like pretty much done now. No, more than half. Let's say three quarters of it. And yeah. Can we have taste, Peter? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I do have like, I have a section of it up on our blog on voice. So there's that. And we are about to start releasing it into the app. So it, it'll be a printed text. And the plan right now is to publish it open access with Degreuter. Okay. So basically what it will be is you will be able to go in the app itself and get the PDF for that chapter or that lesson and read that. So we will actually start introducing that into the app soon. And it will be available as a printed text as well, but it'll be free online because it'll be open access. All right. Any other questions about anything? Caleb asks, how does limited vocabulary hinder the quest for fluency? Would a biblical Aramaic module even be possible in Biblingo without deep dipping into imperial Aramaic? Okay, great question. So limited vocabulary hinders the quest for fluency in the sense, okay, so there's really two issues here. One, if all you're wanting to do is read the New Testament, right? Or the Old Testament, right? In, in Hebrew or Greek, in theory, you could learn all of those words and learn them really well, and you wouldn't be hindered in reading that text fluently. What you would be hindered in is reading other Koine Greek texts or Hebrew texts fluently, okay? So high school students who are fluent readers, it's estimated they have a recognition vocabulary of around 40,000 words, okay? So th that's what it takes to basically be like high school level. So again, to put it in perspective, the Greek New Testament is like 5,000 words and change. It's nothing compared to 40,000. That being said, there's also another component, right? What you actually want to be able to do is be fluent with the words that you know. So what you want is to be able to be very fast at all of the words that you know. So when you're reading through them in the text, you don't have to think consciously about what that word means. You're just um, intuiting it along with the text, okay? So would a biblical Aramaic module even be possible in Biblingo? Yes. Like, it, again, it would just depend on, you know, we might dip into Imperial Aramaic. We are actually going to do a, an Aramaic module. The biggest question for that would be whether we would start with Syriac. Syriac's vocabulary is much, much broader. So we could start with that. And then it, it, Aramaic from there, it would, would be very, very easy. Max asks, when it comes to fluency, I think verbs are the hardest part. Would you agree? For example, for Hebrew, you have to recognize root, conjugation, beyond person, gender, number, suffixes, and so on. Uh, yeah. 
So we didn't even talk about this. Basically, the morphosyntactic information of, of a lexical item, right? You have to become fluent at as well. So you, so this is our fluency drills right now in Duolingo are basically working at your fluency for a particular grammatical item, right? So you know, an ending on a verb. So basically, those also have to you have to get very, very fast at and automatic at. So they are often the hardest part. It is very difficult, especially with Hebrew and Greek, honestly, to become fluent at all of the different endings and stuff like that. So that that would be where our fluency drills now in the app would come in. And I would encourage you to do those. And we are about to release a lot of them. I think I promised that a while ago, but we actually have a ton of new ones now in our database and we just have to ship them out, um, which takes a little bit longer than uh, you would think. Anita, how do you foster in reading long or factor in reading long passages in a foreign language? How do you foster in reading long passages? Okay, good question. So this is part of the issue. What a lot of people in the SLA literature will say basically is that you want to get to 2000 words, like where you know to about 2000 words as quickly as possible. The reason is because that opens up a lot of text to you. And so basically you need text in order to read the, the text. The SLA literature will say, you need to know 95 to 98% of the words in that text. So that means that you need a larger vocabulary than most people have in these languages. If you have that, then reading longer texts does not become so laborious. So that being said, we do have graded readers built into the app. So that would be a way to do it within Biblingo. But other than that, honestly, we need a lot more graded readers. We just need more text to consume at different levels. So is there a benefit to listening to native speakers of Hebrew while reading the text? Yes. So the benefit would be you are strengthening the phonological representation. So basically, whenever you read, you are going from orthography to phonology. Um, so what that means is you're going from the written text to how the written text sounds. And that is true even in dead languages, right? So you are you are necessarily going through the phonological system. If you are not, you are probably not as good at reading. <laughs> uh, an easy way to demonstrate this is with people who are deaf. So it's very hard for them to learn how to read because they don't have a phonological representation. The normal way to read is to go through the phonological system. So when you're reading a word, you are actually pronouncing the words in your head. So you should be doing that when you're reading Hebrew. The more that phonology, the more those sounds get into your brain, the better you're going to be at reading. So this is where you, you might even, this is a, a drill that's commonly done in the SLA literature, while you are listening to Hebrew being read, you might read along out loud. I highly encourage all of you to read out loud a lot. That's going to really help you in your reading fluency and getting the letter to sound correspondence. Max uh, asks again on any advice on becoming fluent with verbs. Again, I think what you're asking about is basically the fluency drills. That's what I would what I would practice. And I know you're waiting on me basically to, to release those and we will. Caleb, for those who learned through the old school methods, is there a short work you'd recommend that introduces the world of linguistics? Modern SLA is arguably as puzzling as the languages themselves. Yeah. So the world of linguistics is large. So if someone says, I did my PhD in linguistics, I would say, okay, well, what did you work on? Right. So I personally would work on like syntax and semantics. Okay. That would be like my my subdomain. And those two are often tied together and morphology, honestly. I know like the basics of phonology for a linguist, right? Which is a lot more than most people, but I don't know the nuanced discussions of phonology in the field. So the question I would have back is what subfields are you interested in? If my assumption is that you're interested in syntax, semantics, SLA, maybe more morphology. I always tell people, Paul Krager has kind of a trilogy, analyzing grammar, analyzing syntax, analyzing meaning. And analyzing meaning is actually open access. It's free. That's a great place to start with those three books. In terms of SLA, honestly, I would start with Paul Nation's The Four Strands. He has an article on the four strands of language learning. That's a great place to start as well. You can see some of the references there. But honestly, any of Paul Nation's works are a great place to start just because he has published on a lot of different things and he's kind of level-headed about a lot of it. In terms of like reading development, William Grabe. Grabe is kind of like the guy. He has reading in a second language, this big book on how you develop reading in a second language. It's second edition. It's published in 2022, I believe. So that would be another another great place to, to go, though that's not really like an introduction. What I would do probably 
is, again, look up Paul Nation's article on the four strands as sort of an introduction to the field. Peter, when can we buy Biblingo merch? So if if I get enough requests, I'm happy to share merch. Honestly, we've talked about doing it for forever. We just haven't gotten around to do it because there have been too many other things. But yes, if you guys are interested in Biblingo merch, we will put some shirts and other things online. I don't see any other questions at this point. I'm just looking to see if I missed any. Don't see any that I missed. So yeah, if no one else has any other questions, I will go play with my kids. Uh, If you do, I'll give you another 30 seconds or so to post them in the chat. I'll just say thank you to everyone who came and engaging in this conversation. It's fun for me to hear your questions and get feedback from you. I'll go ahead and share this. Uh, This is just a presentation right now, but I will share the write-up of this on our blog. So this will be another part of the textbook that we're sharing. Again, you can check out the section on voice on our blog, and we will be sharing more of this stuff in the app very soon. So um, mugs. Okay, Max wants a mug. Oh, hold on. Oh, actually, I think I have more questions. Heather. Does it help to spend time becoming fluent in smaller sections of the biblical text, 10 to 15 verses, even as you are working on some of the lower level processes? Okay, this is a good question. So a lot of people want to like jump into the biblical text, which is good and it's fine. What we really want to be able to do is at the end of the day, you want to be able to read any of the biblical text fluently. The question is, what is the fastest way to get you there? Okay. So you can use the Bible as essentially like a list of vocabulary items. Okay. So you could like 10 to 15 verses. And if you, so if you, let's say, you know, 75% of those words, if you know 75% of the words in 10 to 15 verses, the literature says you can't read that text fluently. You don't know enough words. You have to know at least 95% of the words. Okay. So that being said, you can use those 10 to 15 verses as your vocabulary set. You can learn the words you don't know. And we have an easy way to do this within Biblingo. You can pull it up, create a flashcard deck with all the words you don't know in those 10 to 15 verses, learn those words, they'll be put in a flashcard deck and then you learn those words and then you can read through the text fluently. That's fine. But if you are still struggling with things like letter to sound correspondence, you should work exclusively on that or, or not in terms of like you should do nothing else, but in terms of there should be a concentrated time where you're working on those kinds of things, okay? There are many, many people who cannot read fluently, right? You should be able to think about what you're eating for breakfast this morning (laughs) as you're reading the text because they just, they miss that step, right? They missed mastering the alphabet. You have to master that. It has to be so innate, so inside of you that you don't have to think about it. So I would say that's fine, especially if you're doing it for vocabulary acquisition. If you're doing it for other things like the endings, like if you're trying to get fluent at the endings or if you're trying to get fluent at the letters to sound correspondence, I would say you need to practice those things on their own. But that's that's a good question. Daniel, have you ever heard of shadowing used by Alexander Arguelles? Um, I don't know who that is, um, but yeah, shadowing the idea of just speaking the text as someone is reading or or as you hear a recording yes that is i think i mentioned that earlier that is a great way to develop reading fluency particularly the phonological representation in your head shirts sure, merch because i watched an interview with jason tables and disciple jojo okay we we want shirts i got you I'll, <laughs> I'll make it happen um let's see when does the textbook come out peter chen later this year hopefully uh, i won't, won't be out in published form later this year but we will have it later this year at least most of it in the app I think that is pretty much it. So, all right. Thank you again to everyone. Um, All right. Sorry, Max has one more question. As I read through the Torah, is it better to become fluent in sections before moving on or read through the whole thing and go again? I would probably say sections. I would probably say like master a section, move on. Repeated reading is another. Like if you are good enough at a lot of the lower level processes, repeated reading is like, the most studied way to help with reading fluency. So you read the text and you read it over and over again. You track your words per minute. So this is part of the stuff that we will integrate within the app. But basically you repeat it until you get your reading speed up 
to basically a fluent level or where, whatever your goal is. So I would say do that repeated reading that again, just has a lot of scientific support for it as a way to increase fluency. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you again for joining. It's fun for me to read your comments and interact with you guys. So appreciate it. And we will see you guys next time. Thank you for listening to the Biblical Languages podcast brought to you by Biblingo. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app and leave us a review. You can also follow Biblingo on social media to discuss the episode with us and other listeners. And don't forget to visit biblingo.org to start your 10-day free trial of Biblingo.